The movie begins by depicting a mother and her daughter visiting a shrine on their way to prepare the girl for her impending marriage. However, their journey takes a dark turn when bandits rob them, snatching a valuable necklace from the mother. The younger girl warns them that the blessed virgin will punish them, and just then, a bird flies by, seemingly confirming that the virgin heard her plea. The bandit, looking up in disbelief, is met with an unexpected surprise as the bird's droppings land in his eye. After a moment of laughter at the girl's unusual defense, the bandits return the stolen necklace and allow them to continue their journey. Upon reaching the city, the mother and daughter head straight for the church, where the young girl is to be married. It is revealed that this girl is named Benedetta Carlini. She is brought in to meet Sister Felicia, who is responsible for discussing the dowry and thanking them for providing another bride for Christ. Carlini explains that times have been tough, but Felicia is no stranger to such stories. The two engage in a lively negotiation, almost akin to trading livestock. When Felicia extends her hand to shake on the deal, Carlini humorously points out that they aren't haggling horses, it's just a mere 25 scooty they are discussing. It's surprising to realize that becoming a nun isn't as simple as volunteering, there's a cost involved. You have to pay to be that close to Jesus. Carlini even jestingly refers to him as a haggling Jew when the agreed-upon price doesn't meet her expectations. After the agreement is settled, Benedetta is taken to change into her new attire. While in the company of another sister, Benedetta receives a warning that her intelligence might cause more trouble than it's worth. That night, she has trouble sleeping and decides to wander through the convent. Her path leads her to the Blessed Virgin statue, where she prays to Mary, expressing her loneliness and questioning if her prayers are heard. It's safe to say that Mary heard her, and just to make it weirder, she begins engaging in unconventional actions with the statue, almost as if she's breastfeeding it. When other sisters come to lift the statue off her, they consider it a miracle that she wasn't crushed. However, Felicia dismisses miracles as often causing more trouble than they're worth. Fast forward 18 years, and we witness a play depicting the death and reunion of Mary with Jesus. Benedetta plays the role of Mary and has a vision of Jesus visiting her in a field. She rushes towards him, and her real body is lifted onto the stage. After the play, a feast is held, generously donated by the Carlini family. Benedetta's mother questions her about the unusual movement of her feet during the play. Benedetta shares that she was visited by Jesus, but her mother dismisses it as a nice gesture. As the family prepares to leave, a commotion erupts at the gate. A disheveled woman named Bartolomeo bursts in, seeking shelter from her abusive father. After Benedetta pleads for her parents to help, Carlini agrees to pay Bartolomeo's dowry for her to join the convent. The moment she senses someone's consideration, she seizes the opportunity. That evening, Benedetta assists Bartolomeo, and their interaction reveals Bartolomeo's lack of refinement when it comes to social norms. While the two girls share a bathroom break, the sounds are reminiscent of a hurricane making landfall after hitting rock bottom. Bartolomeo opens up about her past experiences of abuse. Soon, Felicia's daughter, Christina, enters, interrupting their privacy. After returning to their sleeping cells, Bartolomeo kisses Benedetta before returning to her bed. Benedetta immediately prays to Mary, seeking guidance on someone else teaching her instead. The next day, Bartolomeo tries to stay unusually close to Benedetta. Unexpectedly, Benedetta has a vision of being attacked by snakes, and Jesus, wielding a sword, appears to protect her. Jesus assures her that no beast can come between them, and she kisses him before the vision fades. During later confessions, Benedetta shares her visions with a priest who emphasizes that the only way to see Jesus is through suffering. When Felicia summons Benedetta to her office, she senses Benedetta's affection for Bartolomeo and doles out a mild punishment. As Benedetta carries out her new duties, she learns from a fellow sister that God's love comes in many forms, revealing a peculiar chest parasite that has eaten away at her. The story takes an abrupt turn as Benedetta screams in agony in her bed. After a doctor collects a urine sample containing black bile, Benedetta questions the commonality of black bile in urine. It's time for a reevaluation of personal hygiene practices. Benedetta remains bedridden and tied down, and a doctor confirms the presence of black bile in her urine. Bartolomeo visits Benedetta in her dreams, expressing her desire for her that night. In the dream, Benedetta is shot in the hand with an arrow by bandits who then assault her. However, a rather unorthodox Assassin's Creed version of Jesus appears, swiftly dispatching the attackers. The next morning, Felicia informs Benedetta that she's arranged for a roommate to care for her. It turns out that Bartolomeo volunteers for the job. As Bartolomeo settles in, Benedetta begins to warm up to the idea of her presence. One night, a voice calls out to Benedetta, and she wakes to find Jesus being crucified. He instructs her to strip down and approach him. They both undress, with Jesus oddly making sure he's tucked in properly before being put on the cross. When Bartolomeo discovers Benedetta on the ground with holes in her hands and feet, Benedetta is presented to the sisters, who instantly identify it as stigmata. Felicia, however, remains skeptical. That night, Jesus visits Benedetta again, requesting her heart. During the next gathering, the provost announces Benedetta's appointment as the abbess of the convent. Christina attempts to voice her concerns, but Felicia dissuades her. 
When Felicia is asked to relinquish her responsibilities, she transfers her rosary to Benedetta. Benedetta moves into her new room with Bartolomeo, but their interactions are interrupted by a medical emergency elsewhere. Sister Felicity and Christina volunteer to stay with the nun, and they discuss the potential blasphemy occurring. Felicity reminds Christina that everyone knows but chooses not to act, implying that she should keep her silence to avoid being targeted. Later that evening, as the Vespa bells ring, Felicity leaves to attend to her duties, leaving Christina behind to watch over the dying nun. Christina remains by the nun's side as she passes away. Subsequently, Christina is burdened with a confession, a lie about the Saint Benedetta Fortress Stigmata. From this event, we swiftly transition to Benedetta and Bartolomeo engaging in intimate activities in their new quarters. Meanwhile, the sisters gather for their meal, and Christina is called upon to express her thoughts. Standing before everyone, she declares that Benedetta is a false prophet. Her own mother, Felicity, takes a stand in front of the convent and vehemently denies Christina's claims. Benedetta, seemingly under the influence of her enigmatic visions, speaks in her eerie, satanic voice again and commands Christina to whip herself. When Benedetta returns to her room later she finds that Bartolomeo has whittled her mother Mary's statue down to a dildo. Suddenly, the sky outside transforms into a fiery red as a comet streaks across the heavens. This captivating sight draws everyone outside to witness the celestial phenomenon. However, their attention is quickly diverted when they spot Christina walking on the roof. Christina leaps from the rooftop as Felicity calls out to her, but miraculously, she survives the fall. Benedetta rushes over to comfort her, gently caressing her head, but sadly, Christina passes away. When Benedetta attempts to intervene and save Christina's tormented soul, Felicity prevents her from touching Christina and delivers harsh accusations. After Christina's lifeless body is prepared for washing, Felicity discreetly departs in a carriage. Benedetta swiftly becomes aware of her departure and hurries back to her chambers to inform Bartolomeo. Meanwhile, Felicity arrived in Florence, only to discover the city besieged by the plague. She engaged in a conversation with her superior, who assured her that he would investigate any allegations of blasphemy and wrongdoing within the convent. Back at the convent, the comet still loomed in the night sky, and the provost addressed the city's inhabitants, warning them of the impending plague. As he knelt in prayer, Benedetta stepped forward and began speaking to Jesus. She reassured everyone not to fear, claiming that the comet was a sign from the Lord, indicating his watchful eye over them. Benedetta went so far as to command the city guards to close the gates and prevent the plague from entering. However, her proclamation was followed by her sudden collapse. It was at this moment that the nuncio and Felicity arrived in the city, only to discover it placed under lockdown due to the outbreak of the plague. Just when it seemed that Benedetta had met her end, a shocking turn of events occurred. The provost emerged to address the nuns and inform them that Benedetta had actually passed away earlier that afternoon. It was a moment of disbelief, as many couldn't fathom that she was truly gone. The hope for more eerie visions involving a sword-wielding Jesus lingered. However, the astonishing took place during Benedetta's supposed last rites. As the nuncio approached her coffin, Benedetta suddenly shot up from it, declaring that they would all live as long as she did. She even claimed that Jesus himself had sent her back to the living. With Benedetta's unexpected return, her trial commenced. The nuncio wasted no time and began with accusations of lesbian relations. Bartolomeo, however, remained tight-lipped and denied any wrongdoing. But eventually, the nuncio resorted to brutal tactics, taking her to a torture chamber in the basement. There, Bartolomeo was stripped and restrained on a table, subjected to intense questioning about her involvement with Benedetta. Despite the torment, she steadfastly maintained her innocence, vehemently denying any such activities with Benedetta. The authorities even brought out a menacing device, hinting at the harrowing ordeals yet to come. It goes inside the woman and expands the horrifying sizes like an umbrella. In a later scene, the nuncio summoned Benedetta to his chamber, where he inquired about her understanding of love. She steadfastly adhered to her devotion to being with Jesus. While washing his feet during this unusual encounter, she made a startling discovery, a tick attached to his calf, a harbinger of the dreaded plague that had swept over the area. Subsequently, Bartolomeo was readmitted into the convent, and under dress, she finally provided the confession the authorities had been eagerly awaiting. She disclosed the location of the wooden phallus, a crucial piece of evidence. Benedetta was then escorted to a private room. Meanwhile, there was confirmation that Felicity had indeed contracted the plague. On the other hand, Bartolomeo faced rejection and expulsion from the convent. The nuncio, in an ironic twist of fate, retired to his quarters to sign Benedetta's sentencing, only to discover that he, too, had fallen victim to the plague. Benedetta was granted one final meeting with Felicity. During this encounter, Felicity confessed her jealousy over how God communicated with Benedetta. This admission of envy added yet another layer of complexity to their already intricate relationship. Following these events, Benedetta was brought out to the town square, where Bartolomeo sought forgiveness. Benedetta assured her that this betrayal was a necessary step, drawing a parallel to the betrayal of Jesus in the last attempt to cleanse things. The nuncio attempted to persuade Benedetta to confess to everything in front of the crowd, a crowd that was increasingly inclined to see her set free. 
However, the situation remained far from straightforward, with more surprises yet to come. In a dramatic twist, Benedetta seizes a crucial moment to shift the balance of the moral struggle. She joins her fellow nuns in escorting Felicity to the town square, where a shocking revelation unfolds. Felicity unveils the presence of the plague and pins the blame squarely on the nuncio. The complexity of the situation leaves you torn, unable to definitively choose a side to support. Swiftly, the nuncio orders Benedetta's execution by burning at the stake. However, Bartolomeo takes charge and rallies the crowd to hold the nuncio accountable instead of condemning Benedetta. During this tumultuous scene, a fire is accidentally ignited at the stake, and chaos ensues as the crowd overwhelms the guards, taking control of the plaza while the nuncio retreats. Felicity kisses him before the crowd captures him, leaving his fate hanging in the balance. Bartolomeo helps free Benedetta from the commotion. Still driven by her perceived divine role, Benedetta prays over the nuncio as he lies wounded from a stabbing by a member of the crowd. His eventual demise marks a striking and intense moment. As the events unfold, Felicity immolates herself at the stake, further complicating the moral landscape and leaving you with a sense of intrigue and ambiguity surrounding the characters' motivations and actions. Benedetta and Bartolomeo awaken in a countryside barn, completely exposed and vulnerable. Benedetta expresses her unwavering determination to return to the city, despite Bartolomeo's plea that there's nothing left for her there. Benedetta, still convinced that she has not been lying throughout her experiences, continues to believe in her divine protection. Benedetta leaves Bartolomeo behind in the barn and ventures back to the town. However, the twist in the tale reveals that she was not granted martyrdom, and she actually lived in the convent until the age of 70. What adds to the intrigue is the revelation that, aside from the nuncio and Felicity, the plague somehow skipped over the town they were in. Here the movie ends.